Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. It is, believe it or not, the beginning of the summer movie season, and after a forced hiatus in 2020, we will be looking at the summer box office. I'll be making my predictions, almost sure to be partially wrong, of the movies that I think are going to be the 10 biggest grocers of the summer domestically. We're going to get to all of that in just a moment, but before we do that, let's look at what happened at the box office this past weekend, which again would be the official opening of summer in any other year. I guess it still is this year, kind of low-key, and the number one film is the new Guy Ritchie, Jason Statham film, Wrath of Man, as expected, $8.3 million, a little above the estimates from the studio yesterday, which again says that movies are overperforming a little bit on Sundays. That's a pretty good sign for the box office, that there are more people showing up on Sundays than thought. I mean, let's be honest here. There's no really other reality where Wrath of Man would be given the opening weekend of May solo, so you can't compare it against expectation or anything like that. I'd say, again, it's it's pandemic good. It's not remarkable. Remarkable, but it's it's okay. It's all right. Uh, the second film is Demon Slayer. The movie uh, continues to stay in the number two spot after opening behind Mortal Kombat. It continues to beat it uh, as it continues its box office run with just over $3 million. Mortal Kombat 2021 uh, right behind at $2.4 million. Godzilla vs. Kong in number four, $1.9 million. And in week 10, still in the top 10, Raya and the Last Dragon, although very close between Godzilla vs. Kong and Raya and the Last Dragon. We've talked about this with Warner Brothers they're not reporting actuals they're reporting estimates but we're not we don't get these actual numbers so given the fact that there's only sixty thousand dollars or so separating these two it's very possible that Ryan and the last dragon could actually be the number four movie this weekend but we don't get those hard numbers from warner brothers they were they were always reporting them late anyway when I've, as long as i've been doing the show I'm always sitting here waiting for final numbers for Warner Brothers. They're not reporting them now, at least not in a timely manner. So we're not really going to know. But a very, very close competition between number four and number five. Raya and the Last Dragon, after, as I said on this show, kind of a disappointing opening, still hanging around. Still hanging around. People going to see it in the theaters. It is possibly because it is still available only across all platforms it you know the disney premiere plus thirty dollars but still if you want to watch it at home you have to buy it for thirty dollars even off of disney plus so perhaps some people going for that cheaper option to see raya and the last dragon top per theater there are no movies like the scott pilgrim re-release last weekend that was were in smaller numbers of theaters that drew huge numbers so wrath of man is the number one uh, per theater film with 2,890 per theater and over 2,800 theaters. Again, that's uh, that's pandemic okay, but we, we just don't have a real scale for comparison. Everything's on a sliding scale. When we look at the 2021 domestic box office, Godzilla vs. Kong remains number one. It is slowly trying to crawl to $100 million domestically. A symbolic victory, really, more than anything. Tom and Jerry at number two. Riot and the Last Dragon, though, continues to close the gap. It is now less than $1 million behind Tom and Jerry, so it could very well catch up domestically. Demon Slayer the movie also closing the gap. As a matter of fact, if it has a week like it just had, we could soon be looking at that as the new second highest grossing film of the year. Mortal Kombat just behind Demon Slayer. Nobody at number six. The Marksman and the Little Things at number seven. The Unholy passes Chaos Walking to get to number nine at the box office. And then Chaos Walking bumped down to number 10. Uh, I don't think either of those movies are very long for this chart. When we look at the top 10 highest grossers of the 365 days previous, so this is the last calendar year, as we talked about last week, no real changes except that nobody has passed the gross of the New Mutants, so the New Mutants is now in the danger zone. It will not be on this uh, chart for very much longer, and even after we get out of these times, I think I might keep this chart going, because I just think it's interesting. We always look at how things do based on the, you know, the year 2020, and then we wipe it clean and we go to the year 2021. I think this is an interesting perspective to look at the last actual year and see how these things stack up, how they compare and relate to other things, because then we can see how a movie in December, for example, measures up against a movie that comes out in May or June or July. So I think we're going to keep this chart going. Looking at the 2021 worldwide chart, the top five stays the same. Uh, four films from China, one film from the United States, which would be Godzilla vs. Kong. Then at number seven, Tom and Jerry and Ryan the Last Dragon. They just keep flip-flopping around. They're so close. At number eight is a new film, a new film from China called Cliff Walkers that didn't have this huge burst out of the gate, uh, but it is over $100 million, so now that comes onto the chart. 
dropping Raya and the Last Dragon down to 9, and Boonie Bears the Wildlife down to 10. And that drops uh, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0, which was on the chart, then dropped off the chart, then last week was back on the chart, is now back off the chart. So one anime film drops off, but there is some actual official passing of the torch that has to be done. This has been a very close race the last couple weeks. Some people have called it already, some people haven't, but I've seen it from enough sources that I am comfortable saying now, officially, that Demon Slayer the movie is the number one movie of 2020 at the worldwide box office. It's released here in North America and in other countries. Put it over the top. It has topped the 800, and now the animated film from Japan, this is the first time, at least as far back as the records could go, as I could go, this is the first time that a movie not made in the United States, or at least not produced by a studio in the United States, has topped the worldwide box office. So now the two countries that can say that they have had a movie at number one worldwide are Japan and the United States. It's been a very slow and steady race to the top worldwide. Going all the way back, if you remember, at the end of last year when we were talking about the Japanese box office charts and Demon Slayer was going up and up and up and up the charts and became number one in Japan, the success that it's had elsewhere. I know that they're a lot of people are probably going to put an asterisk on this, but, you know, the record book says what the record book says, and in that record book, Demon Slayer the movie is the number one movie worldwide in the year 2020, a year full of a lot of remarkable things. So I guess an anime movie being number one worldwide is maybe the least remarkable thing at the box office in 2020, when in a different year, it would have been the most remarkable thing at the box office. Speaking of Demon Slayer, I actually, if you watch the live show, and I may have even mentioned it on this show, with all of the interest around this and looking at the box office and everything else, I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. So I started watching the show. We have it on Netflix here uh, in the U.S. I watched the entire first season. This weekend, Mara and I went to the movies. It was our first movie in a theater together in about 15 months. Went to the movie, saw Demon Slayer the movie, and be on the lookout because I am putting together a review of the basically the com the combination of the first season of the show and the movie uh, my thoughts characters I liked characters I didn't like this was my first anime series I've seen uh, some anime movies and I've done some anime reviews here on the channel this is the first time I've, I've really done a dive into an anime show so I have a lot of questions I have a lot of thoughts I have a lot of just observations and something that I look forward to expanding my horizons even more and perhaps I'm going to know even more about what to expect but uh, this has been a really interesting first jump into this for me so stay tuned uh, very soon right here on the channel you're going to see my review of Demon Slayer both season one of the TV show and the movie which is now the number one movie of 2020. Speaking of going back to the movies, there was a story that came out last week that I think may signal some sort of a sea change, or at least maybe a difference in how you see some films. Uh, Cinemark, which is one of the major theater chains, announced that they have struck a deal with all of the major studios uh, in Hollywood to show movies that have a shortened theatrical window. That's no surprise. All of the major chains at this point are pretty much going to have to start making those concessions if they've not done so already. But there's one other deal that Cinemark made that is exclusive to them that I found very interesting, was, which is that they have made an agreement with Netflix uh, right now for Army of the Dead, which comes out on Netflix on the 21st of May. Cinemark will show the movie for one week theatrically starting on this Friday, the 14th of May, uh, before it hits Netflix. And this is a, you know, a cracking of the ice, so to speak, because a lot of the standoff between Netflix and theaters have been that Netflix doesn't respect the theatrical window. So a lot of theaters have said, well, we're not going to show your movies. That's all out the window at this point. And so now we have here with Cinemark, a major theater chain who has said that we will show a Netflix movie. The agreement, as I understand it, is just for that week leading up to the release uh, uh, on Netflix. And what this does is it opens up a lot of different avenues. Now, there's some things that I do not expect to change. For example, I don't expect Netflix to start reporting box office revenues. Netflix films have played in theaters before. A lot of them independent chains that uh, are, are booking the movies because they are, were not in solidarity with this thing that most of the major chains were doing, which is saying you have to respect the theatrical window. Cinemark now making a deal. They say it's for Army of the Dead, but they look forward to doing many more deals with Netflix down the line for Windows, maybe a week, maybe longer, uh, in the interest of both uh, themselves, obviously, because it, it markets business, but also because they say that there are filmmakers working with Netflix that are committed to having their movies shown theatrically. 
Martin Scorsese comes to mind. Uh, his show, his movie, The Irishman, uh, did play in some theaters, but did not play a, a huge theatrical wide release. Uh, this could be an enticement for people to come and work for Netflix because if you have a deal with Cinemark, you can say to those directors, even as if, even if it's just for a week, hey, your movie will play in theaters, and if people want to go see it, they're going to be able to go see it, and it won't be simultaneous. So you'll get that 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 exclusive theatrical experience. So Army of the Dead will be hitting Cinemark theaters this Friday, which means uh, look out because I will actually be doing a review of Army of the Dead. I plan to go see it on Thursday. Now what this does do, as predicted and as I was warned when I started the live show, I am going to have to move the time of this week's live show and probably uh, whatever time I pick, I'm going to try to make that the permanent time because, uh, you know, with movies coming out and the fact that uh, already I can sort of tell that screenings are going to be a little tough, at least in the short term for me, um, uh, advanced screenings uh, before a film comes out. Uh, Already there's one major film that's coming out that uh, it looks like the close I'm going to be able to get to uh, any kind of an advanced screening is to travel uh, several hours away from where I live. I'm going to try to do that when I can, but the fact of the reality, and I knew this when I moved, is that I'm not going to be as close to a lot of advanced screenings, which means there are going to be a lot of movies that I'm going to be going to see on these Thursday night opening nights, which I'm totally fine with. The review will be a little later than a lot of my colleagues, but I'll still get the reviews out. That does mean, though, that the live show, uh, if it stays where it is, is going to be consistently an issue, and instead of moving the show back and forth all the time based on the week, I'm going to try to find a new time for that show um, that does not conflict with too many other people that are doing stuff, so stay tuned. The new time for this week's live show, and then this may be the time going forward, uh, I will announce that very shortly. We're going to jump into some things like the Golden Globes news that was breaking today. The Golden Globes is collapsing around itself. Uh, Lots of stuff to to look at this week, uh, but just a programming note to look out for number one for the live show to change days and number two for my review of army of the dead which i will probably put out when i get back from the movie on thursday i'm excited to see this movie in theaters and i like this move i like this move from cinemark uh perhaps uh, you know it it can serve all parties well uh because this is a a movie that i'm very glad to be seeing in a theater There are actually several movies that I'm excited to be seeing in a theater, and it's also time to play one of my favorite games. This is something that I would do every summer, whether I was on camera or not, uh, when I worked over at Screen Junkies and Fandom, uh, which was to look at the summer box office and predict what the top 10 highest grossing movies are going to be. This year is, well, it's, it's always difficult. It's always difficult to do this, but this year's even more difficult because it's sort of like trying to pick out who's going to win, you know, the playoffs when you don't even know who's going to make the playoffs, if the playoffs are going to happen, or if one team is going to get completely yanked out of the league uh, before they even get a chance to, to, to play a regular season game to get into the playoffs. So more than any other year, I have very little confidence in my picks, and we also have no idea what the marketplace is. We haven't really tested the top limits of the theatrical marketplace in well over a year. We We've had movies like Godzilla vs. Kong that have come out. That was a mixed uh, HBO Max release uh, versus theatrical release, and not all theaters were open at that time. We really don't know what the peak of the theatrical market is right now, which makes it very tough to handicap how these movies are going to do. A lot of moving targets, but really, more than anything, this is, number one, it's just fun, and number two, it feels like we're getting back to some form of normal, and, and this is something that I've always loved doing. It was one of the first things that I actually got to chart. The first show that I hosted solo was a summer movie report uh, on Screen Junkies Plus, uh, where I tracked the box office across the entire summer. And that that was really the beginning, the genesis of what this show is right now. A lot of the things that I developed there, I continue to develop and brought over into Dan's Labyrinth and then uh, into uh, charting with Dan and now charts with Dan. Um, So the, the summer box office really is the genesis of a lot of what I do each and every week. So let's look at my picks for what I think the top 10 highest grossing films of summer 2021 are going to be. I'm sure a lot of you are going to disagree with these picks. You're going to say I'm crazy. That's all right. It's just for fun. Starting at number 10, the film that I picked as the 10th highest grosser, and these are in order. So I'm not only trying to pick the 10 movies, I'm trying to pick them in the order uh, domestically that they're going to be on the box office chart. I picked one that is, well, these have almost all been pushed from last year and definitely pushed from some sort of release date. I picked Candyman. 
This is a movie that I am actually very excited to see. I think that it has enough of a, of, a, of a root back to the original movie that you have those fans, but it's not so sacred that if you mess around with it that people are going to get angry, and it looks like this movie is, is actually you know not just a schlocky remake, that it actually is coming from somewhere and has something to say. I think that it could do a, a great business. It's a late summer release. It's coming out in August. A lot of these late summer releases, you feel like you know they may get even a little more credit because maybe business will be back to where it was or, or more theaters will be open, more people will feel comfortable. So I picked Candyman coming in at number 10 as my 10 spot. At number nine, I picked another horror movie, which is The Conjuring. The Devil Made Me Do It, the third film in the Conjuring series. I originally had this ranked a little bit higher than nine, but looking back, I, there was a couple things I thought. Number one, there was a pretty big drop-off, even though the, the universe has succeeded, there was a pretty big drop-off between The Conjuring and The Conjuring 2. And The Conjuring 2 didn't even make the top 10 summer movies the year that it came out, so that kind of gave me pause. The other thing being, this is one of those HBO Max day and date movies, so there is going to be a part of the audience that's going to stay home and watch this because it'll be available on HBO Max. So I put The Conjuring 2, uh, sorry, The Conjuring 3, I guess, down a little bit lower than I initially had it. At number eight, I put an animated film. Animated films have traditionally done in this post-pandemic era, when you look at things like The Croods, when you look at Tom and Jerry, uh, they've done well. And so I picked a movie that actually, uh, I was one of the only ones the last time one of these movies came out to put it in the top 10 and it paid off. The fourth film in the Hotel Transylvania franchise, Hotel Transylvania Transformania. It's gonna be late July. There's gonna be a lot of kids that maybe haven't gone to the movies or or, or making, making it back to the movies that want to see this franchise. It's a popular franchise. So I put that at number eight. At number seven is a movie that's had several release dates, and it's a little risky because you never know. This movie could get pushed. All of these movies could get pushed. That's the other thing. Any one of these could be pushed out of the summer, and I'm just SOL. Uh, but at number seven, I picked Free Guy with Ryan Reynolds. I think this is an interesting concept, the idea of this just random person in a video game world who becomes self-aware. I, I liked the initial trailer. Ryan Reynolds, you know, is going to be marketing the hell out of this thing. People love Ryan Reynolds. Uh, I, I was enough for me to take a risk. If this movie pays off on the premise. Now, it could go the other way. If it sucks, I don't think it makes the top 10. But if it pays off on this premise, I could see it generating enough box office to make it to number seven. So that was my pick. At number six is a movie that's actually coming out very soon, A Quiet Place Part 2 over Memorial Day. I know, like I said, I know that this is one of those movies that's going to have a shorter theatrical window, 45 days, then it goes on Paramount+. Plus. That's one of their new things, that, that they're only going to be in theaters for about a month and a half. But I think it's one of those movies, number one, that people know they are going to want to see in a theater. If they saw the first Quiet Place movie, they probably remember that experience. They may say, I want to go, this may be my first movie that I go back to the theater to see. I want to see this sequel actually in a theater and not at home. This is maybe a little bit too high, but again, the, the, the first movie is well regarded. This was one of the very first movies. I mean, this was literally days away from coming out when it was pushed last year. So I think that there's some anticipation. So I picked The Quiet Place Part Two at number six. At number five is another movie that I really debated, where am I gonna put it? And this was really betting on the high ceiling of a movie like this, even though it is also going to be available day and date on HBO Max, I picked In the Heights. Uh, and I think that, again, first of all, they are already really promoting the hell out of this movie. They did special screenings for Mother's Day. They're trying to build buzz. That to me says that they have some confidence, which means that uh, maybe this movie's pretty good. There is a there's a passionate fan base behind it. You have the Lin-Manuel Miranda. Uh, you have the director of Crazy Rich Asians. I think you're tapping into a lot of things that people may be excited to see. I'm high on In the Heights. This is probably as far as placement my riskiest bet, but I don't know. I just have a feeling. At number four is a movie that a lot of people might have lower which is F9, the latest movie in the Fast Saga. I think it's going to do a lot of business. It comes out in late June. Uh, I think people are excited for it, but it's also the ninth movie in the franchise. Worldwide, I think it's going to do great. But when you look at the Fast and Furious movies uh, domestically, it, it, they, they did Fury 7 did great, and then there was a huge drop-off from 7 to 8. And so the question is, is the trend going to continue, or is the trend going to be reversed? I tend to think that it's not going to be another huge drop-off, but I don't know how much more popular this movie is going to be here in the uh, domestically 
than the last one was. You don't have The Rock, and even Hobbs and Shaw didn't do huge business. I think you're seeing this franchise show a little bit of signs of fatigue. Now, if it's great, then I could see a huge improvement. But I, I'm betting on Fast and Furious. Some people might say, like, well, you're putting it at number four. Some people, I think, would put it a lot higher. I'm just betting that you're not going to see a huge resurgence in business for the franchise at this moment. At number three is a movie that actually just barely right under the edge. Some people would say this is not a summer movie. But we have always defined the summer box office season. It used to be from Memorial Day to Labor Day, but we've pushed it back to the beginning of May now because that's when all the big Marvel movies, etc., started coming out. So really, it's the first weekend of May to Labor Day. Opening on Labor Day weekend is a Marvel film, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I put it at number three. I can honestly see this going lower because it's a new franchise. It's an unknown character. Maybe it doesn't generate that kind of interest, but every time people have said that about a Marvel movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, Captain Marvel, Doctor Strange, it has gone the other way. It's made, you know, they haven't all been billion dollar hits, but a lot of them have. Uh, and so I'm just really betting on the Marvel brand here. The fact that people are just going to be excited to go to, even though there's been one Marvel movie that has already come out that summer, are going to be excited to go to another Marvel film. That's really what I'm banking on. I, I really hope this is a great movie, but I'm banking on the Marvel brand there and putting it at number three. At number two is I'm betting on the DC brand and also a director who is is wrapped up in the Marvel brand. James Gunn and the Suicide Squad is my pick for number two. It's that HBO Max day and date thing, but I, you know, I just wonder how many comic book fans, how many fans of these characters are going to want to see a movie like this at home versus going to a theater and seeing it uh, with their friends. It opens in August, so the, the, you know there will be more time for people to acclimate to the new realities. I think a lot of the restrictions may have been dropped, the capacity restrictions, etc. That's another advantage that a lot of the late summer movies may have. Fewer capacity restrictions if everything goes as it's going, and let's hope that it does. Uh, so suicide, this the Suicide Squad. I'd be very careful for a schmodown player like myself to get that exact title right. The Suicide Squad. I'm picking at number two, and then at number one, I said that I'm betting on the Marvel brand. I'm betting on Black Widow. I'm betting on the Marvel brand because even though we've had WandaVision and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which has sort of let Marvel fans wet their beak a little bit, it's been almost two years since a Marvel movie has come out in theaters. And I think that there is a real thirst and a real passion for that. People are ready to go back. People are ready to jump into this chapter. Uh, if it's Again, if it's a good film, I think that's going to drive a lot of business. It's going to be in the heart of July. Yes, the only thing that gave me hesitation is the fact that it is on that Disney Premiere Plus thing, which means that there are going to be some paying customers who say, I'm going to watch it at home for $30. And I think for people that are in the bigger cities, that might make financial sense because the more expensive a ticket is, the, the more incentive you have to use something like Disney Premier Plus. But I think in other parts of the country uh, where tickets are less expensive and also for people that are you know only going one or two people, a family may to choose the $30 plan. But if one person or two people are going to go, it's more economical to go to a theater. It seems like it's going to be safe. Uh, things have, have improved greatly over the past few months. Uh, I you know I, I'm betting with the hot hand. I'm going with the hot hand and I'm going with Black Widow at number one. To recap my top 10 summer box office predictions, number one, Black Widow, number two, The Suicide Squad, number three, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, number four, F9, number five, In the Heights, number six, A Quiet Place Part Two, number seven, Free Guy, number eight, Hotel Transylvania, Transformania, number nine, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, and number 10, Candyman 2021. Some movies that I left off of my list, uh, Cruella, uh, I, I I just don't know which way that movie's going to break. And again, that's another one that you can pay to watch at home. I, I, I didn't see the big screen appeal. Space Jam, A New Legacy, I did not put on. Again, uh, I know that 90s kids love Space Jam, but I, I just don't know how well the concept is loved right now, how well the Looney Tunes characters are loved. Spiral from the Book of Saw, which opens this weekend, I just... I don't know how much gas that franchise has left in it. Although if it turns out to be great and Chris Rock sort of reinvents the whole thing, then I could see it really exceeding. Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe Origins. Again, it's just with the franchise. I don't know what the draw is going to be. M. Night Shyamalan has a new movie, Old. Who knows with M. Night. Jungle Cruise from Disney. I did not put on because I I just don't, I don't know how excited people were about this movie 
before the pandemic. Uh, the Aretha Franklin biopic, Respect, uh, especially if that uh, picks up a lot of critical acclaim uh, and really gets a great word of mouth, I could see that breaking out. And then uh, Paw Patrol, the movie. I-, I don't know if the kids are still in the Paw Patrol. I, I-, I don't want to know. Uh, so if it's still incredibly popular, then I could see Paw Patrol coming up and, and uh, right at the end of the summer and snagging a spot in the top 10. And then, of course, there's always movies that I've overlooked, movies that either move on to the schedule or that I looked at and just didn't even think to include. I love those little surprises, but as of right now, these are my top 10 picks. I'm sticking to them for summer 2021. Of course, we're going to be tracking the summer box office all year, and because the summer box office has officially begun, this is our first look at the 2021 summer top 10. Right now, Guy Ritchie, congratulations. You've got the number one movie of the summer, Wrath of Man, at $8.3 million. And then because I'm including movies on this chart that open wide, which I'm considering a 1,000 theaters or more, there's a movie starring Billy Crystal and Tiffany Haddish called Here Today that opened just this past weekend in 1,200 theaters and made uh, a little over a million dollars. So while things populate, uh, we're going to see a lot of Jason Statham, a lot of Billy Crystal and uh, Tiffany Haddish on the summer box office top 10. Of course, that's going to fill out as movies open. We're going to have 10 total at some point, and then it becomes fun tracking what goes up, what goes down. Of course, if you have your thoughts about what your top 10 summer movie predictions are, throw them down there in the comments. Uh, you track them with me. Like I said, this is going to be such an interesting year because nobody knows how this is going to work. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's take a break from looking forward and take a step back as we do our box office flashback. And we're going back, and this is hard for me to believe, 25 years to May 10th through the 12th, 1996. And that saw the opening of Twister. At $41 million, I mean, that's a great number now. Uh, In 1996 money, that is an incredible number. One of the seminal summer blockbusters of my life. I was 13 years old. That movie blew my mind. It was the same summer that Independence Day came out, the big visual effects summer. And uh, I may or may not have done this completely intentionally. I think it's fun to think about 25 years ago when Twister came out. But... A little cross-promotion here as well, because this week's All My Movies will be about Twister. We're going to break down the origins of that film, the making of the film, and then I have a very special guest. You have seen him as my nemesis on screen in the movie trivia showdown. We have traded the singles belt back and forth now uh, at least one time each, and I think probably more times in the future. Uh, But Adam Collins, if you don't know Adam Collins, he is one of the newest amazing movie minds that I've been able to meet, and we We had a great discussion about the movie. We had very similar reasons about why the movie appealed to us and and how it recontextualized our interest in weather and and visual effects, movies in general. Uh, It's a really, really great conversation. So look out on Wednesday. I will be dropping that episode on Twister uh, as we celebrate 25 years since it hit theaters. At number two that weekend was the Uma Thurman, Janine Garofalo romantic comedy. That's a 90 sentence. The Truth About Cats and Dogs. At number three, The Craft in its second week with $3.6 million. At number four, Primal Fear, a huge breakout movie for Edward Norton, uh, hanging around with $2.4 million. And at number five, the Jean-Claude Van Damme film, The Quest, at $2.1 million. That's a very 90s top five right there from 25 years ago. As we always do, let's end the show by looking at the streaming charts, and we'll start with Amazon. At number one on the Amazon charts, not a whole lot of change, actually. Nine of the top ten are the same from last week. Nobody, the premium video on demand at number one, followed by PVOD, uh, The Courier, and Tom and Jerry. People still renting the crudes at number four. Voyagers capping a very unspectacular theatrical run at number five on PVOD. News of the World and Nomadland, two award season films that people are renting. Raya and the Last Dragon, as I mentioned, still able to buy for $30, but in the top 10 there on Amazon, so some people are buying the movie. Promising Young Woman at number nine. And Minari, the movie that's come back onto the chart, you can now buy that film, and that was enough to boost it back into the top 10 over on Amazon. Let's look at how things are looking over on Apple. And at number one is The Little Things, a movie that started as the HBO Max theatrical hybrid, also had some award season buzz for Jared Leto. You can now buy or rent that movie on iTunes. So a lot of people taking advantage of that change in the window and renting and buying that film. The Marksman still at number two for people to buy. Shadow in the Cloud with Chloe Grace Moretz, which we saw on the top 10 chart uh, earlier this year, opened up for 99 cent rental. So a lot 
of people, uh, I heard about that movie. I actually heard it was not that bad. Uh, I think a lot of people perhaps had heard the same thing. So they're checking it out. It's at number three. Wonder Woman 1984 in the buy rent window comes back at number four. Nobody at number five. No Man Land at six. Promising Young Woman at seven. Percy versus Goliath at number eight. And then two new films at number nine, The Paper Tigers and Above Suspicion, which also had a limited theatrical release uh, starring Amelia Clark. Let's see what people are watching on Netflix. First, the overall Netflix chart. Jupiter's Legacy, a new Netflix original series, takes over the number one slot overall from The Mitchells vs. The Machines at number two. The Sons of Sam and Selena the Series also making their debuts on the Netflix Top 10, both Netflix original series, followed by Shadow and Bone. It continues to be popular on the streaming service. Monster, not the Charlize movie, but a Netflix original movie, is at number six, followed by Madagascar 3. Coco Melon, still a fixture. Kids love that Coco Melon at number eight. The Circle at number nine. And then at number 10, Dead Man Down, not a Netflix original movie, but a movie that is on the top 10. And finally, let's see what people are watching on Netflix when you boil it down to just the movie. Movies. The Mitchells vs. the Machines at number one, Monster at two, Madagascar three at number three, and Dead Man Down at number four. At number five is The Whole Truth, State of Play at number six, Things Heard and Seen, which is a Netflix original movie at number seven, Scarface starring Al Pacino is at number eight, Open Season at nine, and at number ten, The Clove Hitch Killer. So only three Netflix originals on the chart this week. Looks like more people are opting for their library material rather than the original films that Netflix is pumping out. And that pretty much wraps it up here on Charts. It's a busy week here on the channel. Like I said, I'm working on the Demon Slayer review. Not exactly sure when that's going to come out. I'm aiming for some time this week. We have all my movies on Twister hitting on Wednesday. The live show, stay tuned for a scheduling announcement on that. But that will be followed up by a review of Army of the Dead on probably Thursday night, unless something goes wrong. Then on Friday, I'll be heading to theaters to see Spiral from the Book of Saw. And then next week, we're going to rack it up and start it all over again. Check out the charts even more. More reviews. We are entering the belly of the beast. Uh, and as I said, I I'm going to try to see as many movies as I can when and where I can. So stay tuned. I may be broadcasting from different hotel rooms and places uh, in nearby, at least in this region, because I'm working with the PR people that I'm able to talk to and, and seeing when and where I can see these films. I'm not going to say I can always make the trip to see a movie early, but I'm going to see as many as I can. And I appreciate everybody being patient with me as I make this transition and we, we're all figuring all of this stuff out almost like it's for the first time thanks so much for watching if you want to see even more of what I'm up to you can check me out on patreon at patreon.com slash Dan Merle we're doing our movie club this month on international film and we've got some great ones including Cinema Paradiso and Let the Right One In Parasite Princess Mononoke which I've never seen so uh, if you want to see us talk about those movies you can check it out there's also a commentary track that patrons get exclusively every month we just did our watch along for Monty Python and the Holy Grail so even if you couldn't have watched it live with us you can go back and watch that lots of schmodown stuff really really anything that you'd want uh, if you want to double down on what I'm doing here you can check out there and of course thank you for watching me right here stay tuned I will see you several more times this week and in the weeks and months and years to come I hope thanks for watching stay safe out there and I'll see you next time